Life is pain. Oblivion alone yields peace. You call me stranger. I call myself salvation. The love of a god is not a blessing, it's a scar. If destiny herself beckons me, then I shall greet her like an old lover. There's gotta be more to life than making mistakes and making up for your mistakes. I'm the pedagon of risk and reward. Behaving is more of a suggestion. Fate is an offer I intend to reject. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm unpredictable, bitch. I don't need to be a paragon to help save the world. I came back for a reason, and I am not stopping until I find it. I will solve the Cataclysm, and I'll solve the mystery of myself, too. Four Paragons, four Keepers, one Stranger. <laughs> Odds are in our favor. Now let's go save Endake. Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to Arc 7, Episode 3 of Transplanter RPG Presents The Second Stranger. I am your game master and creative producer, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me all across the internet at by Connie Chong. That's B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G. Namely, TikTok, Ko-Fi, Itch, and Twitter. I'm going to pass along introductions up and over to Quinn. Hi, hello, I'm Quinn, and my pronouns are they, them. I am an any nominated TTRPG designer, sensitivity reader, and actual play performer. You can find me and more about my work over on Twitter at Quintastic underscore. That's with three N's and an underscore BB. Today, I will be playing Sitlali, your local grave cleric and paladin of the weave, who has never done anything wrong in their entire life, XOXO. Uh, they use they, she pronouns, and I will pass things over to Erica. Hi everybody, I'm Erica, and I use she, her pronouns, and you can find me as a Twitch streamer here at Erica Please, P-L-Z, Erica Please, uh, and I do a lot of things there, including uh, Wild RP, I, if you like a, a gay cowboy in the Old West, uh, come check it out sometime, and uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Max. Hello, I'm Max, my pronouns are they, them, uh, I play Dewey Crook, you can find me on the internet, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok at Starchmonger. Uh, I'll pass it to Humna. Hello, everyone. My name is Humna. I use any and all pronouns, uh, and I am a TTRPG performer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at hshahid underscore, where I talk about all of the different projects that I'm a part of. And today, I will be playing Jaron Kadar, who uses they, he pronouns, who is having a bit of a tough time with the gods. It's chill. It's chill. Everything's fine. Wonderful. Now let's pass things over to Erica for some words from our sponsor. Yes, we are proud to announce that this episode of The Second Stranger is sponsored by Dimitri Opines and Explain Trade, a negotiation skills training consultancy believing in the power of D&D and transplaners' potential to grow, tell great stories, and lift our community up. Explain Trade trains negotiators for governments, big companies, NGOs, and offers e-learning courses for individuals looking to get better deals from their boss. Check them out at explaintrade.com. And now, uh, continuing some thanks, Max? I would love to continue this thanks train uh, by thanking our Patreon Paragons. Those are people pledged to our highest tier on Patreon. And those people are Alex, Azra, Bradley, Brooke Bright, Charles, Chiakres, Tora Eckert, Emma, Hat, Kunding, Lex Slater, Marvelous, Purple Mouse, Scruffuses, and Targa. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of your love and support. Um, and I will... Quinn, it's been a hot moment. What it's happened. Max, I'm so glad you asked. Last time on The Second Stranger, Jaron, Sitlali, Vasanti, Dewey, and Rev warp into the URL and are greeted by a scene of mass chaos. Empty monsters are attacking researchers and corrupted emissaries alike. The party attacks, trying to save both the emissary and the researchers. They succeed in getting the empty beasts away. For now. Dewey sees his ex-wife Uwalani in the rubble and heroically pulls her out, but she is not happy to see him. Sorry, lover boy. His daughter, Hana, has become something of a protege to Lilith, the director of the URL, and Uwalani makes Dewey promise he'll go get her. Jaron hears Scott and Nectis calling to them, but is reticent to make any decisions. Vasanti and Rev continue their, uh, argument. 
Lolly gets a little feral about hunting down Adam. <laughs> no big deal. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Together, the party enters Sector 9-2 and uses passcode Eden to enter a chamber filled with painted red eyes. And the myriad. And that's what you missed last time. Use exclamation point recap in chat to reach our written recap document. Now, Hamna, can you tell us about today's gorgeous title? Yes, I can. As always, the titles of our episodes come from lines of poetry written by marginalized creators of all stripes. And today's title is Beatles and Other Low Gods from Summer Somewhere by LaDawn Osmond. And the full verse reads as follows. If you press your ear to the dirt, you can hear it hum. Not like it's filled with beetles and other low gods, but like a mouth wrought with gospel and other glories. Listen to the dirt crescendo a boy back. Come, celebrate. And thank you for that, Humna. And now, content warnings for this episode and this campaign in general may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, blood and bloodletting, apocalypse, trauma and grief, death of loved ones, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, medical experimentation, monsters and monstrosity, and a teenager in danger. So a note is that our cast lines do include harm to children, and while this arc does feature a youth in a dangerous situation, please do be assured that above the table she'll never be in any danger or come to any harm at all. She is also explicitly not being manipulated or mentally controlled and is in full agency and control of herself. Use exclamation point CW for a full list of these content warnings, exclamation point safety for a look at the cast's lines and veils to know what uh, situations we'll never venture into no matter how dark things get, and exclamation point HANA for a reminder of our particular grappling with uh, the teenager in danger content warning. Uh, and with that out of the way, I think it's time to kick shit off. I think it's time to begin. From the swirling grist of the beyond, the effulgent murk whence some demons come, the myriad was birthed into the now. He rose from the chalk-marked floor, from the waxy mush of candles, from the wet, red, votive heart, from the cracked bones of worshippers, from the ash the spit, the blood, the yarrow, the holy books smothered and burned. He appeared as she knew he would, a dog-headed man, black-furred, hound-eyed, gleaming white teeth, licking tongue. The woman beyond the circle speaks in perfect abyssal, the growling syllables, the maundering tones. A request is made. A woman, a prophet, a target, a victim, a seer, whose visions must be cut short. Payment is promised. A spell to sustain form in the now. The demon accepts. He kills the prophet for the job, and he kills her beloved for fun. And now... The now is new to him, new dimensions of feeling, new facets of pain, new sufferings, new little torments, new agonies, miseries, degradations to enjoy, ever-changing, ever-turning tortures on the breaking wheel. But his interest, like his being, is fleeting, mercurial. He has his fill of ruptured nerve, of spilled artery, of sputtering pleas for mercy. He longs for the lustrous smog, the capricious fluid whence he came, the great beyond his home. And he is on the precipice of returning when the world ends. The plains are severed like loose threads, monsters he has never seen explode into being. He tries to go home, but there is no home anymore. No after, no beyond, just nothing. And for the first time since entering time, the demon feels fear. 
So when the woman calls again, he comes. Another request. Another victim. An inventor this time. A father. A coward. A genius. An unwilling fugitive of destiny. Payment is promised. A return to the beyond. Even as the world caves in. The demon accepts, but he is no fool. He knows the woman has a greater design, an allegiance to the emptiness that has consumed the stars, a fealty to the stranger he must learn more. But first, his task. He hunts down the father, toys with him, plays with his food. But before the killing blow is struck, his hound-wise nose picks up a smell, an aura that rings inside his blackened soul, a scent familiar and holy and profane. The gods, this one is god-touched. So he strikes another deal, and he buys himself time. But the woman is no fool either. She watches him. She has always been watching him, her eyes ever-present, ever-looking mother's vision. And when he returns from Kirtal, empty-handed, smelling like ice and thread, she does what she must. Dewey, Basanti, Sitlali, and Jaron. The myriad stands in this chamber, a dog-headed demon in a crisp black suit. The painted eyes on these walls rove, their pupils turning, moving in every direction, watching, watching. Something's wrong. The myriad is hunched, heaving. The boundaries of his form bubbling like the surface of molten tar. His head twitches, neck cracks, glitches, angel white saliva dribbling from glistening teeth. And between patches of sweat-stained fur, you see skin, black skin pulsing with even blacker veins throbbing on his gums, his nose, the whites of his wide red eyes. Set into a wall, a rectangular pane of glass. A viewing bay, a window, and beyond it, Adam. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, wearing an emerald green suit, hands clasped behind a straight back, watching, smirking. The hard steel door clangs shut behind the five of you. Mechanisms were piston lock. The myriad jerks his unstable gaze in your direction, drool puddling at his feet. How do the four of you respond? Sitlali has never met the myriad, but they know he killed Leaf and Rev. But I think looking at him for the first time, something in their soul that is a newer addition resonates. And they remember what little they do know about him. This is an emissary of sin. And her gut reaction is that he needs to be saved. Mm, I really like that, Sitlali. As your eyes fall upon the myriad who's sort of jerking, twitching, right? Like almost cracking. And like these odd, strange, wrong, wet crunches from inside his body, like his ribs are folding in and cracking and then his spine is inverting and then his heart is splitting in two, metastasizing and then shrinking. Like he's unstable. Every time you look at him, he looks a little different. Like the boundaries of his form are wobbling and glitching and warping. And you recognize that as, yes, Sen, 
Sen's presence, I think unbidden Oka's face, pops across your vision of them changing into multiple different forms, and then you're back looking at the myriad, twisting snarling, drooling, dribbling, and you feel a tug toward him, a whisper of a voice, a fox's growl, a rabbit's sneer, in tandem overlaying themselves upon each other in your ear. My child, as that fragment of Sen seems to recognize the myriad. How are the rest of you responding? When Vasanti sees the myriad, I think she has a moment of a series of flashbacks, beginning first outside of a hotel room uh, in the in the court, where she and Rev first connect on their mutual passions for revenge, and the, they kiss, and then it flashes to the moment where they make a pact with each other that if they come across the myriad, they would both try to kill the myriad, and if they run into Sievert, they would both kill Sievert. Which then flashes Vasanti to the moment that Sievert is killed in front of her. And then it flashes to Tyrion, explaining how Sievert has been protecting Vasanti pretty much all of her life, even in the most horrible things he ever did. And then flashes back to now in the present. And Vasanti's heart is so torn between between the promise that she made to Rev and also that feeling of unbelievable regret that she has for all of her feelings towards Sievert and how she doesn't think she can help Rev make that promise come true. She just looks at the mirror and just feels nothing but unbelievable sympathy or she feels like she needs to protect him in a way to stop Rev from doing something she may eventually come to regret. That's the feeling she has right now. In this very moment, she's going back and forth between Myriad and Rev and is very conflicted right now. Yeah, Vasanti, I think as you stall there, you hesitate, your eyes flicking between this demon that's twitching, glitching, drooling corruption and your girlfriend, fiance. Rev, who steps forward, I think she steps past you, you don't see her face, but she throws out her hand and Grim is instantly in her grasp, and every line of her muscle is taut and firm, and she just has, it's like tunnel vision, she is staring him down, and even as she starts to approach the myriad, Visanti, that conflict that's bubbling within your soul, like comes, rises to a fever pitch, and you realize it's not just your own trepidation and hesitation, it is Scott and Nectus. These god shards are brimming forth, at the bottom of your throat like hot fire smashing against gentle wind and they are pulling you tugging you and you feel that one thread of promise that you had made to your god shards as well the promise to always follow your heart you feel it like sharp thorns digging into your heart as it tugs you forward Visanti. And I think like unbidden, your own body didn't compel you to do so. It was your god shards. We see like your torso flare forward and you stagger like a couple feet like toward where Rev is. And like one of your hands even like flings upward and you can feel Scott and Nectus roiling inside you, telling you, follow your heart. You hear Scott's voice go, you have to follow it. And Nectus's voice chime in in repartee. You have to do right by her. Letting her kill him won't do right by her. And while this happens, Jeron, we pivot over to you. Because as you witness Visanti stagger forward, jerking almost like the myriad, compelled by something greater than the two of them within them, you see them for a split second, Jeron. You see Scott and Nectus. Holographic forms superimposing themselves over Vasanti's body glitching. You see a proud, tanned, half 
elf person with a braided crimson red hair going all the way down their spine, all taut muscle and freckles currently flared in concentration. And then glitching over, you see Nectus, tiefling, lilac-skinned with broken horn gold eyes. They seem to be fighting not against each other, but against Vasanti, trying to get her to move forward, trying to get her to stop Rev. And even as Vasanti approaches Rev, you see something flare to the top of Rev's form as well. Glitching holographic black feathers rippling down the presence of the blackened raven queen that is also compelling her to act. Jaron, how are you responding? Jaron, having stepped into this room, uh, not really recognizing the Myriad too much, I don't think that the Myriad had really come up in conversation with the Dewey ever, uh, or even with Sitlali, so when Jaron walks into this room, I don't think he recognizes the Myriad, but their eyes kind of go and follow Adam behind this glass. And for a moment, they are, they are filled with this, like, anger, this sort of instinctual anger at what Adam had done. And when their vision is sort of directed away from Adam towards the Paragons, towards the gods, I guess, that are fighting against each other, I think that same sense of anger starts to well up within Jaron because this isn't our fight. This is the gods' fight. We are just here fighting for them or being puppeted by them in some way. And I think just this this thought, this idea of this is unfair, unfair to him, what Adam did, unfair to Sitlali, what happened to them, unfair to Rev, to Vasanti, and just the sense of injustice is welling up inside of them. And I think their eyes go back to Adam and they decide he needs to be stopped. This is all his fault. Mm. Uh, and Jaron, as you train your eyes back on Adam, we're going to pan and swirl down to Dewey. How are you reacting to all of this? Dewey similarly sees like a set of flashbacks every time he's encountered the Myriad from the storeroom to behind a wagon outside of um, Dabathati, to all the times that the Myriad has come very close to killing Dewey, um, and all the times that the Myriad has hurt Dewey. Um, but as these memories go past in his mind, um, the emotions, at the very beginning, the emotions he had for him were like hatred, I guess. Um, resentment, I suppose. Uh, but as these memories go on, that feeling sort of softens for Dewey um, as he's learned more and more about the Myriad. And now, in this moment, seeing the Myriad in this state uh, and with Adam on the other side of the glass... Stop it! Stop it! No! <laughs> Gay wrist? Gay wrist? Dewey Myriad shippers rise up? <laughs> the, uh, the feelings uh, soften explicitly platonically. <laughs> uh, no, where was I? Um, the feelings soften in that he sees, standing in, this, in the middle of this room, sort of, he sees himself. And seeing the myriad puppeted by Adam, he feels, he feels very little of that resentment anymore. Um, and more pity, which is funny coming from Dewey, right? Uh, and he just puts up an arm out next to him. He doesn't look at Rev, um, but he puts an arm out to stop her from tearing the myriad to shreds. Um, a solid arm, not just like there for show. Rev's waist bumps against the arm that you throw out and she does stop, but Grim is still in her hand. She is gripping it with enough tightness to crush rock. And all of you just sort of hear her voice, strangely composed, strangely calm, go, Dewey, Vasanti, I am going to kill him. Do not intervene. 
Vasanti is going to dimension door herself between the Myriad and Rev. I'm telling you right now, this is not going to solve anything. Vasanti, step aside, please. Vasanti's gonna hold her ground and uh, her one hand is going to erupt into red glowing magic as a dragon claw covers over and all of her, the diamond studs of her bracer are going to start glowing uh, as she's prepared to do magic. Vasanti, you promised. And Jaron, you see like the raven feathers superimposed over Rev's form begin to glitch themselves. Like she's destabilizing within herself. Like she's this dark emotion of vengeance and retribution is sort of like forming a barrier between herself and her god shard. And Vasanti, as you look at Rev, you see her face is just twisted in pure hatred. And she doesn't look like the Rev you know anymore. She looks like the Rev you first met in the court. Just an undead monstrosity, not a paragon. Move aside. Rev, I promise you that killing the Myriad is not going to make the pain any less. It's not going to make things right. You are only going to be left feeling unbelievably empty because your only goal you had in life, you achieved it, and yet it didn't do anything. It didn't bring leaf back. It didn't make the feelings in your heart go away. Those feelings have nothing to do with him or any of this. It, they're just, you can't do this right now. I, I wish I could explain more. And I think while she's saying that, she like, her heart is just like pushing so hard. I can't explain, but look at, I know that this feels like a betrayal, but I, I love you so much. I would never want to hurt you, but I cannot let you do this. You wanted to kill Tyran, you did. You wanted his soul to go to the empty. How is this any different? Why won't you let me have this? You didn't let me have that either. You did what was you thought was right in that moment when you took Tyran's soul and let him, you did what you thought was right there. I'm not trying to exact vengeance on you for that. I'm trying to tell you what is right right now. <laughs> What's right? What's right? Vis Visanti, what would you know about what's... Envy, you are going to take 62 points of slashing damage. As the myriad... His left limb sort of wobbles and contorts and turns into just a massive blade, almost like a mockery of Rev's scythe as it just like slashes against your back. Vasanti is pretty fucked up from that. Uh, I think she's just gonna fall to the ground and uh, she's not unconscious, but she's pretty that close. So she's gonna just fall to the ground. Vasanti! And Rev is going to rush forward, and on that, uh, Jaron and Sitlali, the two of you also see movement beyond the window. You see Adam just sort of <laughs> smirk a little bit wider and turn around and walk deeper into whatever viewing chamber he's in uh, with like a clear like purpose. Like his, he's going somewhere inside that room to do something really bad, presumably. What do you all do? I think seeing Vasanti fall to the ground, Jaron's first instinct is he steps forward as if he's going to try and help her, but then he sees Adam moving, and I think in this moment, they turn instead to sit Lolly. He's leaving. We need to stop him. I think sit Lolly just kind of freezes for a moment, and their eyes flicker to that window. He has like a hive mind connection to the empty beast, and I um, 
you can mimic you can mimic him quite well if I remember, Jaron. Um, so I and they rifle through a pocket and pull out the vials of empty goo that they had gotten in the first room and shove it towards you, Jaron. Are you sure? I mean, I sure as hell can't do anything with it. Let's okay. get this bastard. Let's go. And Jaron will follow Sitlali. And on the way out, Sitlali casts two spells. Okay. One is, one is a healing word for Vasanti. Um, because, mm, ouch, that looked painful. Uh, but Vasanti heals 11 points. Uh, so this is a little bit, there's a little, little smooch. Uh, I think literally it's like, like, they don't even look back. It's just kind of like she like tugs on the weave, like you're tugging on like the thing that makes a bus stop and like just finds the right one that will connect to Vasanti and like restore her. Um, and then as they're walking, Sitlali casts Sending. Okay. Mercy. He is here. One of us dies here. Tell Oka. I love you. Does Mercy get to respond? I always forget. She does. You you feel, you tug on the weave to reach out to Mercy, and you feel like the threads ping, 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 as each word is said and shot down, I think, a funnel to reach your beloved. And then you feel it bounce back to you. Whatever magic ensconces the URL is preventing your message from getting out. And sit lolly on she's the rapier and stalks after Adam. Mm. So the only, there's no like door. The only visible place to see Adam is the window itself. So you'd either have to like teleport behind it or smash it open, just as a heads up. Uh, so we're gonna swivel back down to the Myriad crew. Dewey, Rev has like fallen temporarily. She's like crouched over to like look at Visanti and she flicks, like she jerks her head up as she feels the weave pulse from Sitlali, like sending some healing magic toward Visanti and she nods and you see her beginning to rise and spin grim as she's approaching the Myriad like, like she's going to fucking kill him. And the Myriad is sort of like, has drawn his scythe arm back to his body and like a long, like lizard-like tongue slops out of his mouth and sort of licks up the blood along the blade. And you see his like crimson eyes are going in every direction, like those on a chameleon. And he's just sort of like jerking his head and gurgling and looking like he's not even talking. He's not even fully here. You see those black corrupted veins of mother's blood pulsing along his skin. What do you do? As I see her stand up again, I just yell out, Rev, you wanted to save souls? Of course I do. That's what I, that's what I'm supposed to do as the Paragon. But I, I came back for one reason, Dewey, and it was to kill the Myriad. You stopped me once before and I, and she looks torn between pausing to protect Vasanti and talk to her and to go after the Myriad and turn her back on Vasanti. She is torn. And I think you as a paragon can also see like that superimposed figure of the Raven Queen's form. Like those holographic feathers are glitching, glitching, glitching. She is a woman opposed against herself. You heard it firsthand from Vasanti. Take this opportunity to save the two hardest fucking souls to save in this world. <sighs> Ugh! She lifts her scythe as if to slash at the myriad with deadly force. Ugh! And when she like slams it down, it just hits the ground and it craters some like rock and tile with that explode upward in a plume of destruction. Fuck! As she's just sort of planted there, like torn, unable to move, caught between the myriad and Visanti. And you see the myriad scythe jellies and ribbons back into a, a limb and his blood red eyes fix onto you now Dewey I'm going to cast Bigby's hand and grab the hell out of the myriad I, you see Dewey 
uh, his eyes flick back over to the myriad from staring at Rev, and with um, a swipe of his hand, you see like a spectral hand up here next to the myriad, and uh, just grab him by the waist. Uh, Are you gonna pull him toward you? No, I just want to uh, grapple him, I think. Okay. Yeah, you want to, like, restrain him, like, hold him in place? Yes. So this ghostly hand appears by his waist and grabs onto it, and sort of like scruffing a dog, the mirror is, like, he jerks forward toward you, but, like, stops, like he's, like, pinned into place. And he wrenches himself in one direction, like he's spinning. And when he's done spinning, he is a completely different form. He turns into just pure acid. It sloughs right past the ghostly fingers uh, of Bigby's hand. Like he melts into a puddle on the floor. That's just sort of like eyes and this like black sludge, this fur, bits of teeth, uh, snarling, snarling, and like a shadow, like a sentient moving shadow. He sort of like slicks across the broken roughened tile, like past Visanti's form, which is still sort of hunched on the ground, past Rev, who has Grim spiked into the floor, past her legs toward you. And on that shadow approaching you quickly, we are gonna swivel back to Jaron and Silali. Uh, as we approach the window, Jaron looks over at Sitlali. Only one way through. And he takes the uh, butt end of his dagger and sort of like smashes it up against the window. I think at the same time, Sitlali, empty hand, with their empty hand, um, just kind of thrusts forward against the glass and cast spiritual weapon. Um, yeah, I'm into that. You know what? Yeah, I'm into it. Uh, so why don't the two of you make a separate, for Jaron it'll be a athletics or sleight of hand check, and for Sitlali will be an arcana uh, check, just to see the consequences of this. I got a dirty 20. Okay. 23. Yeah, the glass shatters. There's a cacophony of sound as shards just go slashing in every direction. And I think with your rolls, that means you take a little bit of damage from the exploding window. Uh, so both of you are going to take, oh, that's not bad at all, uh, 14 points of slashing damage. As these sharp shards slash past your face, past your arms, past your torso, they finally settle like crumbled dust by your feet. And you see the viewing bay in full. There's just sort of a sill that you can easily just like step over without having to climb. Uh, a massive chamber, much bigger than you thought it would be. Like at first you th you'd think this would be the size of an office just based on what you could glimpse from the door. But this is like the size of the, the test chamber that the five of you zapped into initially. And there are monsters in here. There are empty beasts of every shape, size, coloration, comportion, distension that you can imagine. They are just teeming, roving around here like mindless zombies until the two of you arrive and shatter the glass. And beyond this veritable sea of empty beasts, you all see Adam. His back is to what's happening in essentially the test chamber with tons of eyes plastered everywhere in the myriad. He's actually hunched over working at, at the base of a dais, a raised dais. There are sigils etched along the stone and some sort of strange, like they look jury rigged tubes that have been ripped off of the backs of machines and like various strange components just scattered all around, like uh, stuck into the dais. Uh, and he's in the middle of like cranking a winch, but his back is toward you and he's kneeling on the ground. What did the two of you do? I think Silali just kind of looks around at all of the uh, empty beasts looks to Jaron. Can you control that many at once, do you think? First time for everything, right? Good. And then I think, because spiritual weapon lasts for a minute, um, I think this sort of whip-like weave translucent acid magic that they have, I think they just fucking hit Adam in the back with it. Okay, okay! So Sitlali, make an attack roll with your spiritual weapon. Uh, and Jaron, while Sitlali does that, tell me how you try to control the beasts here. Sitlali had mentioned that 
uh, Adam has a sort of hive mind-esque connection to all of the empty beasts. And given that Adam has his back turned to us and presumably doesn't know that we're here yet, I think Jaron's first instinct, especially with these beasts not yet attacking, is to try and be stealthy about it. So they try and cast message to the empty beasts using Adam's voice. Okay. And try to say, <laughs> hold your position. Okay. Sitlali, what did you get from your attack roll? 30. Okay. And Jaron, what did you make me? Make me a persuasion check. Yeah. Oh, persuasion. God. Yep. That or deception, I'll let you choose. Uh, we'll go with persuasion. 26. 26 and a 30. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well. Yeah. Okay. Uh. So as <laughs> as that lance <laughs> repels through the air toward Adam's back, Jaron, you hear in your head Adam's voice ring back to you. That just says, "Protect me, will you, darlings?" And an empty beast launches itself into the air and intercepts the lance. It like lodges itself into its like umbral bulk and it, it fucking explodes from spiritual weapon. It like bits of mother's blood go flying everywhere, but the lance also like is sort of stopped in midair uh, from the force of the shield. And the rest of the empty beasts with your 20 something roll, they start to jerk and glitch. Like some of them stagger toward you, almost like they want to attack, but a couple of them sort of stay in place and like confusedly sort of like jerk and lob and twist around. Like they're conflicted, right? And Jaron, you hear this voice both in your head now and also out loud as Adam slowly rises to his feet, saying as he does, what a way to make an entrance. Hasn't anyone told the two of you that shattering a neighbor's window is in poor form? I think Jaron, hearing Adam's voice in their head and also out loud at the same time, takes them back to Dabathati. And for a second, it like paralyzes Jaron, I think. That feeling again of having Adam inside of his head for a second, he's like concerned, I think, that, oh no, like has Adam somehow cursed them again? Is it happening all over again? And so I think they kind of instinctively like grab for Sit Lolly's arm when they hear Adam's voice and he's unable to say or like move at all in this moment. Lolly grabs onto you, Jaron. And uh, Connie, what were the dimensions of this room again? Oh, uh, I don't think I gave them. Uh, maybe like 70 feet deep, 100 feet wide. So with their shield out, like half in front of Jaron, Delali just kind of looks at him in the eye. And without saying anything, just tugs on the weave and casts Blade Barrier uh, so that it goes down and around and it kind of cuts off most of the empty beasts so that it's Adam and them. Okay. Uh, on you flinging out your hand about to, I think, weave this spell into existence, we are going to cut back down into the pit with the Myriad, Rev, Vasanti, and Dewey. Vasanti! You hear a kind of sick, wet, crunching, gurgling sound, and you feel something slither past you as you start to come back to consciousness, back into your body, as you feel a healing energy begin to suffuse you. And I think as you blink, you see Rev's face come into focus a few feet away from you. She has Grim, the point of it, planted into the ground, and she is heaving and panting. Like, she wants to move. She's, like, jerking as the myriad, like, sloughs past her legs, but she also can't. You see, like, the Raven Queen, you see it too as a paragon, is, like, fighting her. She's fighting herself, right? She's, like, fighting the promise, the oath she swore to the Raven Queen when she became paragon to venerate each soul, to prioritize the sanctity of life and death and her own drive for vengeance. What do you do? Uh, Vasanti 
still very hurt. I would say she's tries to start to get up and just feels that her, her body is still probably just completely decimated still. Um, she looks up at Rev. She looks at this goo that's kind of slinking around. And I think she gets just like, she wants to protect the myriad, but also it's like, she doesn't want him to like, get away. So, I think she's just into this like goo she's just gonna cast like firebolt into it just to like hurt it a bit and maybe try to stop it from moving away sounds good okay make a spell attack roll all right 22 okay uh so fire explodes out of you and ignites this black slime like uh like an oil trail going up in flame red flame green flame purple flame licking licking chaotically turning different colors as you fight through your own haze of pain visanti and you try to tap into that well of magic and channel it and the myriad heals itself off of the ground as the flames repel up its uh, serpent-like spine at this point. And Dewey, you see him towering above you as uh, the flames turn black and they grow big and crackle off in huge pillars of pure fire, uh, gouting upward as he sort of transforms himself into a charcoal-like fire salamander uh, to weather that blow and absorb the fire and channel it uh, his own way. You see like a massive maw elongate four, these snarling, snapping teeth, this like kind of wet and yet burning, glistening skin as you see these claws kush, 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 explode outward from his serpentine torso. And as the fire that you channel forward, Visanti, sort of like turns black, Rev is going to turn as she sees that the tail of the salamander is like peeling off the ground and starting to whip toward you. And Rev actually tackles you out of the way of this attack. And I think the two of you go rolling across this like tiled floor, these plumes of dust following your explosion. (sighs) Visanti! I, I, fuck, I don't know what to do, I don't, I don't know who I am if I, if I'm not death. Rev, and like, Vasanti like tries to get like, Rev's eyes to meet hers, you're the woman. that I love. (laughs) That's who you are. You are Paragon of the Raven Queen. You're so much more than just someone out for revenge. (sighs) You are too, Visanti. You are too. I know you regret what happened to Sievert. Neither of us could have seen that coming. And Tyrion, Visanti, please, you have to understand. I couldn't. I couldn't let his soul go. Visanti's eyes just fill with a lot of tears and they just start streaming down, like just instant. Like those words just hit Visanti in the heart and she just starts crying. I know that you did what was right. I know it just... it hurts, but I know that it was the right thing to do, and I'm I'm sorry. No, 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 Visanti, you don't have to apologize, you... I... You're right. Killing the Myriad, it won't... It won't bring her back. And it... It won't bring me back, too. It'll just... It'll just plunge me into oblivion, won't it? Because if I kill him, I'm just... I'm just back to being that mindless, heartless, soulless revenant. And I don't... I don't want to be that anymore. I... I want to be what the Raven Queen knows I can be. I want to be something that's 
worthy of of being loved by you. You are so incredibly worthy of love, not just for me, but from everyone. <sighs> and like Rev, I think collapses sort of against you and it's the two of you just sort of like kneeling on the ground and she like it's just throws you into this huge hug and pulls you tight <sighs> Vasanti Vasanti listen please and she like pulls pulls away for a moment like very serious you have to understand what I did to Tyrion is it's not some eternal paradise okay every person's after is different he will have to answer for everything he's done Every person he's killed, every life he's taken, to your mother, to you. Something shifts inside of Asante. Like that was like the exact balm she needed to hear. She hadn't heard that before. She didn't know that because Asante never knew anything about the gods before all this started. And she just looks at Rev in the eyes. I don't want to die to the stranger anymore. I want to live with you for as long as we can. Uh, and you see Rev's face just twist once, very briefly, in this deep, deep pain. And then she smiles, and you see tears brimming in her eyes. <sighs> Me too. Me too. Dewey, the myriad on fire, raising its inflamed, sharp claws, <laughs> begins to bear down on you. What do you do? Dewey, he moves the, the spectral hands to be like, to do like a, a weight motion. Uh, and he sort of, he turns back, he turns his back to the myriad. Um, and he's fiddling with something behind his back um, with the god jar. And I think... As his concentration lapses, the hand dissipates, and you watch as the myriad in this flaming red salamander form begins to lunge, like in slow motion, down at Dewey, um, who's kind of still messing with something behind him. <laughs> um, and just as at the last moment, just as the myriad's mouth is about to meet Dewey's hollow, soft, hollow boned body. Uh, you, he turns, he whips around and his arm goes up as if to shield a blow, but it's just, it's just his like arm. He's got one hand behind him still. And as the myriads flaming fang, do salamanders have fangs? Yeah, this salamander does. Okay. As the myriads flaming, dripping red fangs sink into Dewey's arm held up uh, above him, we see behind him in his other hand, uh, a red rose um, and as the flaming fangs bite into his flesh the rose's head catches on fire Dewey as the myriad's massive razor sharp flaming fangs dig into your arm there's like a heartbeat motion as like your eyes go wide and it's like you sort of beat out of yourself for a minute and your eyes flick down to those teeth and you see that black mother's blood seep downward and into the wound. And Dewey, this is pain in a new dimension. As mother's blood begins to course through your veins, another heartbeat pulses through you and again you're thrown a little bit out of your body as it happens and I think you begin to reel backward and it's a sensation of like sinking right like you're sinking away from yourself away from your consciousness and when you rise again you are somewhere else completely where are you um, I am outside my old house the one I shared with Ulani and Hana I'm at my outdoor workbench, working furiously on some s very small contraption. Mm. And I think as we like zoom in and push in on you at this workbench, I think we see you with like chisels, with hammers. There's like a blueprint next to you. You're sort of sawing away. There's like working, working, working. Like dust is coming out and whatnot. Uh, and you hear, you hear voices from inside the house. 
Ualani's voice, bright and bubbling, chittering like a bird song, and Hana's voice, high and squeaky like a little mouse, excitable, running around. But the feeling that surges within you upon hearing these voices isn't happiness or calmness, it's... Well, I think there's guilt, Dewey. I think there's guilt and regret. Why? Last week was Hana's birthday, and I had to work late. Um, at the URL, they made me put in overtime, and I wasn't there for her actual birthday, and the gift I got her was the gift I made for her um, whenever I had free time at work. It turns out it was like a sort of like a counting tool to help her learn her numbers. It's like sort of abacus-like. Um, but I gave it to her, and it turns out she already had figured out how to, she'd already learned how to count. Um, with her mother while I was gone. And so Dewey is out here. It's late. He's out here furiously just trying to come up with something, uh, a better gift, um, since the first one was a failure. Mm, yeah, and Dewey, as you're working hard, like put, putting the pieces together, consulting your blueprint, picking up different tools and putting them back down, like tying certain components together, this feeling in your chest of guilt grows and it grows and it grows and as the darkness the lateness of the hour continues to turn onward you see the lights in the house go out and shadows begin to encroach upon the periphery of your workshop as you continue to work and this guilt continues to bloom and the shadows continue to burn in, 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 swallowing everything, swallowing up the sound of chirping crickets, of belting bullfrogs, of the rushing of nearby water, of the smell of a late summer evening, all of that vanishes, is vacuumed into nothingness until it's just you, Dewey and your hammer, and your chisel, and your present. And as you look down at your working feathered hands, strewn with ash and dust, knuckles burning from working all night, those shadows eep in ever closer. And it's just you, and even your workbench is gone. It's just you in this darkness, Dewey. It's just you and your guilt. And that pain of mother's blood sears through you. Your vision goes wobbly and everything goes black. And we're going to take a break on that. Uh, so we'll be back in 10 minutes, everybody. Enjoy the music. Uh, love you so much. Shpisho, pisho.
And we're back. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break. Uh, we're going to be back with more Arc 7, Episode 3. A reminder of content warnings for this episode and this campaign in general may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, blood and bloodletting, apocalypse, trauma and grief, death of loved ones, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, medical experimentation, monsters and monstrosity, and a teenager in danger. Uh, as a reminder, as always, our cast lines do include harm to children, and while this arc does feature a young person in a dangerous situation, please be assured above the table she'll never actually be in any real danger or come to any harm in any way. She's also explicitly not being manipulated or mentally controlled or magically controlled or anything like that, and she is in full agency and capacity of herself. So use exclamation point CW for a list of general content warnings, exclamation point Hana for a reminder of our specific content warning about a teenager in danger so with that out of the way let's hop right back into it and dewey as your vision goes black and as the searing nerve-rending pain which is somehow dwarfed by the guilt washes through your body we open up on a room filled with empty beasts Jaron and Sitlali side by side, facing off against Adam. Sitlali, how do the blades whirl into existence? It's sort of like they've always been there, but no one had been able to see them. They hadn't been activated quite yet. They just kind of, hello, uh, with a little pink flourish, I think. Uh, and technically a creature starting its turn in its area and has to make a dexterity save and... Dex save? If, if, okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, cool. I will make a dex save for the monsters that are caught in it. How big is this thing? Like, what are the dimensions? Uh, it's 100 feet long and 20 feet high and 5 feet thick. So the way that I've cut it, I guess it's 50 feet on both sides. Got it. Got it. What, what is your, what's your save? 19. I shit you not, I rolled a nat 20 on that save. <laughs> okay, so I think how I'm going to resolve that is as the blades whirl into existence, several of the smaller beasts immediately are eviscerated. Uh, they just go flying, they turn to goop, put these wet splats as mother's blood goes flying everywhere. I think the two of you also get splashed with some of this residual goo, like black tar flinging and spraying onto your bodies. Um, but a couple of the larger ones definitely dodge out of the way or they're split in two, but their two disparate halves keep wobbling and keep moving, right? And with this like massive wall of just previously unseen knives and swords and blades slashing themselves into existence, the monsters mobilize. There are several that, because of how they've been slashed, slap onto your side of the wall. So a couple of these like puddles of goo, and all of you see them begin to rise up and take form. And Adam lets out a, <laughs> sit lolly, sit lolly. So it does appear you've gained a few new tricks up your sleeve, but I'm afraid these monsters answer to one person only. And that's me, the real me. Attack. And the beasts that form all around you in puddles, Jaron and Zitlali, begin to like repel limbs out, huge gnashing teeth and maws, like rending, ripping hind legs. Jaron, what do you do? Hearing the command from Adam, I think Jaron tightens their grip on Sitlali's arm and says out loud in Adam's voice, the weave is not your enemy. In an attempt to redirect the monsters from attacking Sitlali, because Sitlali is literally the paladin of the weave, the weave flows through them. And so I think uh, he's trying to make it so that the monsters like don't attack Sitlali specifically. Okay, I'm gonna keep your persuasion roll from earlier. And as you speak in Adam's voice, you see these like five or six kind of like just lambently void struck monsters jerk their heads. Some have one, some have several, some have none at all. Away from Sitlali and at you. 
and Jaron. I need you to take the brunt of all this, all of these attacks. Uh, so make me a strength save. Yes, Lolly. They do take half damage on a successful save from Blade Barrier. <laughs> okay, all right. So roll, roll your, roll your damage die. Sixty ten. Okay. <laughs> That's so many. I got a seven for my save, by the way. Seven. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, good to know. So they take half of 47. Okay. That is going to be 23. 23. Yeah. Okay. I think how I'll resolve that is 23 monsters straight up die uh, from the blade wop. Like you've eviscerated 23 of them, but these are the ones that got passed and they're the only ones that got passed, maybe five or six. Right. But you did, you did take out, a, take out a good chunk of them. Um, Jaron, that is not sufficient. You are going to take a decent amount of damage. Uh, let's see. From all of them combined, that is going to be... 24 points of piercing damage from their biting teeth and gnawing jaws, and another 47 points of poison damage. I think uh, as a response to that, I have uncanny dodge. So I think the way that uh, what happens is that Jaron, having said this command, having felt Adam's voice inside of their head is thinking, not again. I am not letting Adam hurt somebody that I love again. And in this case, the person that he is trying to protect is Sit Lolly. So he lets go of her arm and starts walking towards Adam. I think this connection, he's letting himself, I think, like sink into this hive mind, into Adam's voice, into Adam's being. And I think that connection allows them to like a little bit anticipate when the empty monsters are going to attack and he's able to dodge like some of their claws, some of their teeth, etc. Like, just weaving in and out. Not all of them, but some of them. As they're just walking straight towards Adam. Yeah, Jaron, as you walk, I think these empty beasts that attacked you, like, gashed at you and bit at you and clawed at you, but you're just sort of like... <sighs> you sink into that empty connection, that hive mind that you're trying to tug on. I need you to make me a constitution saving throw. 19? Sit Lolly. You watch as black veins begin to spider web themselves from the gaping wounds caused by the gnashing teeth and rending claws of the empty beasts upon Jaron's greenish brown skin. Those veins begin to pulse, and with every pulse, Jaron, you feel like pain ricochet through you. And you're starting to like feel a little dreamy, like you're starting to float away from your body, but you're trying to stay rooted as well. And sit lolly, through this, you hear Adam fucking laugh. <laughs> oh, what is this, Jaron? <laughs> what? You're trying to take mother's blessing for yourself. Don't you know the initiation ritual itself rips your soul in half? And you're just trying to take it with force. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun to watch. Your friend shred himself into pieces. You don't deserve this power. Jaron, you can't talk. Oh. The pain... Oh is so intense that I think you try to open your mouth to speak, but what comes out is garbled vocality like the myriad. So, Jaron, what does Sitlali hear as you try to speak? I think Sitlali hears maybe like specific words that have managed to make their way through this like garbled I want to say it sounds slick and wet, like like if you take a bucket of water and you just throw it really hard onto concrete, that is the sound that comes out of Geront's mouth. And the only words that Sitlali is able to catch are Mother, Take, and Adam. I think Sitlali is seeing red a bit. And they look at Jaron, and they look at Adam, fucking laughing, fucking Adam. They look at Adam. They look at 
Adam. And she reaches up to the robe that has eight stars, one on each side, and rips one off and flings it at him. Okay! Which is a fifth level magic missile. So that automatically hits, huh? Yes. So that's yeah. seven dots. So that's, what is that? 74 plus uh, seven? Um, let's see. I gotta do some math. Hold on. What's 28 plus seven? 35. 35. That many. Okay. Force damage, right? Yes. You, f- you fling the star forward and how does it appear? Is it like seven motes of light explode outward and pummel into him? Or does it... Oh, it doesn't appear a different way. I think the star just kind of travels, and then as it gets closer to Adam, it turns into the Wheel of Sin, made up of seven motes of light, and then they just convalesce on him. Oh, yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Boom. And I think this pummels him backward, like uh, onto the ground next to the dais that he was kind of fiddling with, with all these tubes and wires and components just hanging everywhere. He lets out a ooh as he hits the ground. And as he does, Jerron, even though you're starting to feel woozy like uh, like a toxin, right? Like a literal, like a soul toxin is surging through your body. That's that tether. You feel a moment of clarity. As Adam kind of loses his grip from being blasted uh, on the empty monsters, you feel yourself rising back to the surface. How do you tether yourself to the now? I think what tethers Jerron to the now is in that moment of like wooziness, of haziness, I think Jerron's like vision started to like drift from here to there from here to there, and in that, the exact moment that Sitlali had blasted Adam is the exact moment I think that Jaron's vision had drifted over to the window, to the broken window, and seen Rev and Sitlali and Dewey outside, and seeing the god shard superimposed on top of the paragons, I think that is what tethers Jaron to the now, a reminder of what it is that they are fighting for what it is mm. that they are here to do. I like that. And as your gaze sweeps back into the battlefield, I think because empty corruption is running through your veins now, it hurts. It hurts a lot. You know what? I'm going to just have you take some like minor damage from just being corrupted with mother's blood. Don't worry about it. Um, it's just going to be another 14 points of necrotic damage this time. Um, <laughs> that's just sort of like sizzling at you. As you sweep your gaze across this battlefield, you see something you have never seen before. You see yourself embedded in this empty network. You see these beasts with like these blackened wisps trailing off their form, all connected. You see this wisp also trailing off of you from the veins starting to eke themselves up your wrists and your hands and your arms. You see that wisp trailing off of it, like smoke off of uh, the cracked surface of magma, wafting through the air toward Adam. Like he is the nexus here. He controls all of this. And you see, a black hole in his chest where his heart should be. And spidering outward from that hole are these veins. And I think because you are literally infected with mother's blood right now, you understand intimately what it is. That is, well, that's mother's blessing. That's the thing, that hole, that circle, that miniature seed is what allows him to control these empty beasts. And on your eyes fixed on that circle in his chest, we cut back to Vasanti. Rev has been holding you this whole time. She lets you go. And we hear a sickening crunch coming from behind the two of you as the myriad bears down on Dewey. What do you do? Vasanti is... Still not great at the moment. Um, I think she will be using some time to stand up. And the myriad is still, like, crunched onto Dewey's arm, right? 
Oh yeah, like a literal dog that's gotten a bone and is not letting go. And as the Miri is like biting into Dewey's arm, Dewey's just sort of standing there. Looks like maybe like like he's having an out of body experience or something. Like the only other time you've seen this is when like a uh, uh, paragons turn into paragons and they like briefly have a moment where they're like out of their bodies and they commune with their past self. Dewey kind of looks like that. He's just sort of standing there, beak slightly open, looking up at the myriad, but like a flaming rose is clenched in one other arm. And the myriad's form is shifting. It's turning from a giant fire salamander to an alligator, to a tiger, to a dire wolf, back to the myriad. That dog-headed man, salivating angel, white, drool, dribbling in puddles onto the ground, <laughs> crunching. What do you do? Um, I think V is... She's gonna cast Chromium Orb and pull out... She doesn't want to go with fire, because she feels like, especially because that form was like... At least the one form was like fiery. She wants to make it, uh... Let's go with the cold element. Uh... She'll just make a blue chromatic orb form in her hand and trying to be non-lethal about it, she's going to throw the chrom- chromium orb at the back of this creature that's locked onto Dewey. Okay, make an attack roll. All right. All right, so the attack roll is 24. Okay. Uh, a bright blue orb of cold twists itself into existence, launches itself through the air and explodes along the back of the Myriad's, like, perfectly crisp suit that's currently ripping and tearing at the seams from his unstable form. And we see, like, ice immediately ripples down and rhymes across his body, uh, and these spikes come out. So why don't you roll damage? All right. Um, 17 points of cold damage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you all hear the Myriad... Uh, as the ice rhymes across his body and he sort of like hunches inward still not letting go of Doobie and then flings like rips his back uh, outward uh, like he's doing he's flexing his shoulders together and the icicles explode off of him in every direction as he forms some sort of hard shell that like punches the ice off and I need you to make a deck save <laughs> oh I love that for me um 19? Okay, yeah. As you dodge and weave and drop and tumble your way out of these, like, exploding ice shards, Rev also, like, twists her cape and, like, like teleports out of the way of the immense, sudden onslaught of these icicle spears. But even as the myriad shakes off the last of this frost, still not letting go of Dewey, you see one of those eyes on his head travels down his body like the eye travels to the back of his neck and opens up to lock on you Vasanti. so tell me what is a childhood monster you've always been scared of oh gosh um a childhood monster when Vasanti was particularly young uh, she and her mother lived kind of out in the wilderness, and I think, I think this forest was like filled with. The only thing that kept people popping in my head is a wolf. Like there was like a wolf who liked to live in the forest that she kind of lived near, and she was just like terrified. Like her mother made it like some big, like a like, fucked super, up, yeah. like real scary. Okay, like, in, yeah. In her mind, this was like a huge like, like Bud, but like the nightmare version of Bud almost. I can work with that. The red eye closes, and a second wolf head grows out from the base of the myriad's neck, Uh, but this one doesn't have fur. It's made of pure skin. Uh, And like a long limb cracks and slumps and slurps itself into existence, Uh, another limb comes out, crunches, and slaps onto the ground as, like, the myriad literally starts to form two different wolves kind of joined at the back. Uh, One of them is still the hound-headed man that's grabbing onto Dewey, and the other one is, like, a literal wolf coming out of the back of his spine. And this one is made of pure skin. It has no fur. It's just pale, pallid flesh. And it doesn't have claws or feet. It has hands like grabbing humanoid hands with fingers and these long jagged nails 
whoosh, and this part of the wolf hits the ground and it cocks its flayed head in your direction and every part of its skin pulses and oozes with black veins. I need you to make a whiz save. I'm asking oh, for so many saves for you right oh now. Make a whiz save. I'm, I'm running through the gamut with Visanti. Well, it's still 17, so... Okay, 17. You will have to pick one. Uh, you're either going to take a lot of psychic damage upon seeing this horrific thing, uh, answer a really tough question, uh, or be rooted to the spot in terror and not be able to move until this wolf is gone. God. Choose one. Oh, God. Well, um... I mean, if I take any more damage, I'm probably down, so I'll... God, I'll, I'll, t I'll take the rooted to the spot, I guess. Just okay. petrified. Yeah, Visanti, you... It's like this wolf, like, gets huge above you. We see its shadow fall on you, and suddenly you're no longer Visanti, paragon of Scott and Nectus, but just a scared little girl lost in a wood without your mother as you stare up at this wolf. And we pan up into the burning red eyes of this creature into darkness. We plunge into shadow. And Dewey, we find you here just in darkness, in shadow, subsumed, swallowed by your own guilt, by the pain of mother's blood. What tethers you? Being back in that space, the home he shared with his wife and his daughter, reminds him of the good times that they did have. There were some. There were some before his work consumed him, before his guilt consumed him. And I think the fact that he's, he's still got this rose, flaming rose behind him in the now, which is warding off the fire, the burning from the myriad. Um, and I think another memory bubbles up to the surface for Dewey. Yeah, I think as you're plunged and lost and mired in your own mindscape, your subconscious bubbles up to greet you. And I think it appears not as a vision at first or even a smell or a sound, but a feeling, Dewey, of warmth. Warmth on your feathers. The warmth of sunlight. Gall Tanger's radiance. The next day. And as I think this like warm orange glow starts to bubble up behind your eyelids and yes, your eyelids begin to flutter, that pain from mother's blood also seems to dull a little bit. And I think there's a part of you that's very far away from here that just sort of thinks analytically, logically. Huh, well, you must have built up a resistance to my poison. Now haven't you, Cardu Quirk? As this ghost of Kilohana's voice drifts away and you open your eyes and you're back at your workbench, but you're propped up on a chair? and there's a soft pillow behind your head and the smell of tea nearby. And as you like blink, you see your own workbench and you see like a mug of tea that's been set out for you. And as you start to like come back to consciousness, uh, you see that there's someone standing in front of you as you're like blinking kind of in this like early morning light. And it's Uilani. And her hands are propped on her waist and she's sort of leaning down looking at you, right? Like her head like cocked to one side as you like, Come to. Cardu? <laughs> Did you stay up all night? I'm so sorry. I, uh, I'm so sorry. It's, it must be late. I have to, um, forgot to go out to the store this morning. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll be... <laughs> Look at you. You're all, what is this? You're all wet. What is this? Do? You're all dewy. Uh, oh man, I must have slept through the night out here you were hammering away at your outdoor workshop on night hana and i didn't want to bother you but look at you what is this uh and ulani walks over and examines 
the thing you are still in the process of making for Hana, the present, right? And why don't you just tell me, like, what the concept of it is, and whether or not it's actually done? Um, he's... so... he's taken apart, um, the... the toy that he'd made before, um, and sort of built on it, improved on it, so it's like... he's taken off some of the beads from the abacus, and it's sort of, like, uh, he's added the multiplication, um, function to it, and the division function. <laughs> And also like square roots, um, but he's still trying to figure out how to get those to work with, you know, the rows of beads. So it's not quite done. You made her a what is it like a T one eighty four calculator? <laughs> oh my god, I love that. Yeah, that there's still some. <laughs> yeah, there's still there's still some, some components you have to weld on, but it's like maybe like sixty seventy percent done uh, as everything's laid out. <laughs> Car two. Do we? Look at you, covered in all of this water. You. That's very sweet of you. Thanks. Are you sure she'll like it? I. It's messed up big time earlier. Cardu, do we? You're always fixated on the things that don't actually matter as much as the things that really do. And Uelani pulls out a little comb that she had made special for your feathers, and she starts like brushing you down. She's like wicking the morning dew off of you. She like takes out a cloth and dabs at your eyes to like get, you know, to get the mist off of your eyes, picks up your glasses and cleans them for you, right, and hands them back as she talks. What Hana really wants isn't isn't a present, do we? It's just spending time with her dad. Hana! And sort of like coming out of the house, like, but like, I think the door slams open and there's like excitable little kid like bubbles down and she's going, dad, 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 dad. And she's like tumbling down. She falls, she face plants into the ground. There's like silence. And then she gets back up with like he, like a big grin and she like immediately starts running over to you again. Hey, sorry, dad's all wet. I don't want to, uh, you don't have to hug me if you don't want. You're going to get all wet too. Dad, it's not just wet. That's morning dew. Perspiration that occurs before the sun rises. Like, like the earth sweating? Like the world sweating on me? The earth uh, doesn't sweat, dad. It was a co- It doesn't have any pores. You're right, you got me. She did get you, Dewey. She did get you. <laughs> well, uh, Hana, what do you think of this gift your dad's been trying to make you? <laughs> Let me see. Let me see. I can't see. Okay, and like, Hana reaches up for uppies from you. I grab her by the waist and go whoop and put her on my lap. Ooh! Is this an abacus? Sort of. It's got uh, new functions for all of your cool big kid math skills. Yeah, I already know subtraction and addition. I, I know, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of you. Oh! Division? Multiplication? Is there a function on here for prime numbers too? Uh, there will, there will be, yes. Next. You're like, Renati's like looking at you overhead and is like nodding. <laughs> like, you better have that function. Oh yeah, of course. I totally remember that. Yay! Thanks so much, Dad. I love you. I love you too. Now, can we play uh, Inventors and Robots inside? Sure, let me just get uh, dried off. I want to be the inventor. I want you to be the robot. Of course, yes. Of course. I'm going to fill you up with oil. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> All right, Hana, why don't you get washed up for the day first? And Ulani looks back at you and ruffles your, your feathers affectionately. <laughs> this really was very sweet of you, Dewey. She's going to love this present. Thanks. Are you, are you sure we want to stick with Dewey? What? You don't like my nickname? I think it makes sense. Cardu, Dewey... Covered in dew. Aw, my little dewy bird. Embarrassing. <laughs> and she laughs and leans in and gives you a kiss. And I think like on the kiss, right? Dewy. You start to feel yourself bubbling away from this really sweet moment. Right? Like the sunbeams have completely warmed your feathers and is starting to just sort of like grow a little bit colder and colder as you feel yourself drifting back toward your body in the now. And do we right as you plunge back into your feathers and feel that pain beginning to brim on your arm again. We cut back to Adam, Jaron, and Sitlali. Jaron, 
You see that black plate swirling around in the crevice of Adam's chest as you're connected to the hive mind of the empty beasts. What do you do? Jaron has been single-mindedly walking towards Adam this whole time. At this point, is it safe to say that I've like made it up to Adam? 100%, yeah. He's sort of like reeling, trying to pick himself up from being pummeled in the solar plexus in the exact same place by seven different darts, right? It literally knocked the wind out of him and his golden hair is kind of hanging a little bit in front of his eyes. Jaron still has that dagger in their hand that they used to crack open that, open the window. And they walk up towards Adam, look him squarely in the eyes and they say, this is all your fault. Everything that has happened. <sighs> oh, Jaron, 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 Jaron. I'm just a cog in this machine. All of this, my fault, I'm flattered. Even if you are just one part of a bigger machine, you are one part that will no longer be able to function. And I think Jaron pulls back his arm and prepares to stab Adam straight in the heart. But I think like as yeah. he goes to do so, he feels like a stirring that starts in the palm of their left hand and kind of like thrums its way up through their arm into their chest. And I think as you're Arm is cocked back. So, Wally, you see this. You recognize the motion. That's the motion of a someone striking to kill. But Jaron, your your hand stills. And like that stirring in your arm, you realize what it is. It's blood. It's your blood. And Oka's. And we see like whirring into existence, a bright red blood rope, I think, glows along your arm as that promise that you had made to Oka activates. Uh, and you feel that rope uh, tying you somewhere very, very, very far away from here. Wow, where the fuck is Oka? You don't, they're very far from here. Um, you feel that rope binding the two of you tighten and begin to feel thin and fray as that murderous intention bubbles up inside your body. Duran's voice starts to shake and it starts to weave in and out of Adam's and their own voice kind of mishmashing between the two as his arm tries to, I think, like tug at this blood rope that is connecting Jaron to Oka. And their voice is shaking and wavering as they say, but he has to pay for what he did to me, to you, to all of us. And I think... Jaron goes and tugs as hard as they can on this rope, and the dagger, I think, pierces the wall next to Adam. And in the same motion, Jaron takes his other hand and plunges it into Adam's chest, where that black hole where his heart is, and pulls, trying to pull it out. Girl, okay, yeah, make, roll me a, roll me a d20. Just a d20? Yes. I got a three. Is that good or bad? <laughs> I guess you'll find out imminently, Jaron Cotter. Zilali, you watch as the dagger plunges into the wall next to Adam's head. And at the same time, Jaron's other hand dips into Adam's chest, and Adam lets out a scream. You've never heard him scream before, ever. This is like a horrific, shattered yowl as Jaron's fingers just go digging inside his sternum. Sitlali, what do you do? I think the blade barrier just kind of like, disapparates in some pink sparkles. Uh, ooh, um, and I think Sitlali just starts moving as quickly as they can uh, and just yelling, Jaron, what are you doing? Jaron, Jaron, can you hear me? Are you good? And Jaron, 
with your three, that's when you rip it out of Adam's chest. So Lolly, you see, at first you think Jaron has ripped Adam's heart out of his chest. You're like, what the fuck is that thing in my friend's hand? And then you realize it's too circular to be a heart. It's too perfectly spherical. It just looks like a black hole punched through reality. It doesn't even look like it has shape or form. It's just a circle so dark that you can't tell if it's round or flat. And Jaron, this thing is thrumming in your hands. And you almost hear it like, almost like whisper at you, right? Uh, and you know that if you put it inside yourself, you'll have his power. With this black hole in his hand, Jaron says to Adam, you're not worthy. And puts it into their own chest. You plunge this black hole into your sternum and the world around you pulses, right? As and it just turns like a black and white for a minute and like sweeping out from your vision, everything just goes grayscale. And I think, Jaron, you need, you need to take a minute to reel and like deal with this thing being put inside you. And sit lolly. You see Jaron reel backward and Adam let out a cry, a whimper almost, as he falls limply onto the ground after this thing's ripped out of him and put into Jaron. And Adam, shaking his hands on the ground, looks up, and you see that the glamour has has worn off. He looks exactly how he looked in that gas station in Ohio. Uh, kind of limp, a lot less attractive, a lot less put together. Like, it, you know, like everything about him is just like, has just been downgraded by s several notches, right? He looks sweaty. He looks hurt. He looks confused. There's like fear on his face that wasn't there before. <sighs> and he's touching his chest, like desperately scrabbling at it, even though there's no visible wound at all. Uh, and you see black veins begin to snake themselves up his, like the sides of his neck. And he lets out a uh, of pain as he throws his body back and like slams against the wall. Uh, uh, uh. Gerard, you're still reeling, I think, from putting uh, <laughs> mother's blessing inside of you. Sitlali, what do you do? I think they slow a little, but they keep walking towards Adam, their rapier in hand. And she isn't sure if he can even hear them. But she starts talking. I saw you fall through that portal onto the beach and meet the chrysalis. You're not from here, Adam. <sighs> Ugh. And Adam says something in a language you do not understand. You have tongues, right? Yeah. Okay. I assume you just, I assume you like tug on it, right? And like, yeah. like it's, it syncs up like radio waves reaching a common frequency. You say he's, and you realize he's saying, no, 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 no. And he turns around away from you and starts desperately attending to the dais again. Like he's like cranking like a lever, like turning some sort of wheel, like uh, unplugging something and replugging something into the dais. No, 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 come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Adam, you're not from here. You don't have to serve her. I, I had no other choice. I Sibali. I, I, and as he's talking, like, the, the mask is gone. As soon as Jaron ripped that black hole out of his chest, all of that glamour, all of that put togetherness is, is just completely gone. And you see it, him for what he truly is underneath all of it. He's just on his hands and knees, desperately connecting and disconnecting wires and trying to figure something out with the dais. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, look, I'm in this shit too deep and I just want to go back. Okay, so just let me go back send you back yet but maybe if you no, switch no, your I allegiances 
No, no, I can't. What? I fucking stay here? <laughs> what the fuck is that? Your world is going to end, okay? But my world still has a little bit of time left uh, before the seed blooms and annihilation consumes everything. I'll still have a little bit of time. I mean, time is relative. I, I'll have what? Like 30, 40, 50 years left? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Just let me, hey, just let me go, okay? <laughs> just let me go. Seed, what seed? What are you talking about, Adam? <laughs> you, you guys are in way too fucking deep, okay? I'm going to jury rig the shit out of her ritual, use it as a slingshot, which will then, yeah, the coordinates, it'll, 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 it'll rubber band me back to Ohio, and, and I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back, and I'll be the fuck out of here, and just please, just let me go, okay? And I think Sitlali reaches him and pushes him away from the dais. Oh, I don't, hey, what, what are you, stop, 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 hey, 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 listen, just let me go, all right? This thing only has enough charge for one person, one trip. I just want to go home. Sivali, look, I just, I just want to go back to Cincinnati, all right? I just, uh, I just want to ooh for the Browns, the Reds, the Bengals, I just want to, I just want to bitch about the dating pool. I just want to visit my sister and her stupid fucking kids in Chicago. I'll play a video game. I haven't played, I haven't played a goddamn video game in over a year. I haven't eaten Cheetos. I haven't had a goddamn monster energy drink. I live in a two bedroom apartment with a slob of a roommate who never does the dishes and plays shitty music way too loud in the shower and I would cut off my left arm with my teeth to eat Chef Boyardee on the couch while he plays Fortnite on his PS4 and I scroll through am I the asshole on my phone I <sighs> I know it's not much I know my life is sad and small and pathetic and worthless, but it's, it's my home, is it, Holly? I just want to go home. The Lolly crouches down in front of him. I don't know what most of those words mean, um, other than yes, you are definitely the asshole. Uh, I don't think that was ever really a question. I don't... I understand you want to go home. But if you... No. You have helped damn this world. <laughs> and S you have to answer for that. Sidali, please. You saw me on that beach. We're similar people. Right? It was going to fucking eat me! What else could I have said? What else could I have done? Should I have just died on that beach? I just wanted to live. All this shit, everything I've ever done, I just did it because I wanted to live. I you took my changeling magic because you wanted to live? I was in too deep. Sitlali, I... Please. I'm so close. I'm so close. This, this will work. It can, it can, it can, you can let me go, please. How about I make you a deal? I'll consider it if you answer some questions. Anything. Where is Lilith and what does she have waiting for us? Lilith is in her private workshop. Dewey should know where it is. Shh, this... The pillar of light that shot out from the URL 
It's the ritual. She's consecrating souls. The empty monsters that attacked on Adolin during the Cataclysm. They've been holding on to souls for the seed, waiting for the final paragon to be fully realized. The ritual consecrates these souls to the seed so it can empower it, so it can bloom. And at the same time, the stranger is supposed to awaken, okay? The stranger will help feed the paragons and their god shards to the seed, and then the seed will bloom and everything will end. But I don't fucking want that, okay? If I go back to Earth, time is strange. I might still be able to live the rest of my life before annihilation reaches Earth. That's all I want. So, Lolly, you have to know this place is doomed. Not if I have anything to do with it. <sighs> okay, but let me go, all right? And Sitlali reaches into one of their pockets and pulls out that strange black cylinder with the green runes on it. I figured out your little scheme. This is it, isn't it? This is mother's blood. What was it doing in your world? Earth? You called it Earth? What is it? How, how did it get here before you? How did you... How did you get that? It's complicated, and we don't really have time for that right now. Uh, and he, like, reaches up a hand for the cylinder, and they jerk it back. <laughs> Sonali, that's... That's my favorite drink. That's... That's a monster energy drink. It's... It's like coffee or tea. It's... It's a drink. This isn't important? No, not at all. It's just... It's just a drink. And Sitlali, as you look from the cylinder to Adam, back to the cylinder, back to Adam, you see those black veins creeping up his mouth, like up his lips, up his cheeks, and you know instantly in that moment that even if he did let him go home, even if his machine worked, he'd bring the empty to this earth. Yeah. He'd contaminate another world. Yep. He's too far gone. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, was that your last question? Can I go now? We had a deal, right? Our deal was that I would consider it, and now I have a couple more questions. Um, do you have any last requests? <laughs> what? What do you mean, Lust? You said this was your favorite. Do you want to drink it? Are you going to kill me? Yes. I don't have a choice. But you do. Why? Why? Do you want the, f do you want the fucking drink or not, Adam? If you kill me, you're just... If you kill me, you're just a murderer. You're just like me. If you kill me, you're just like me. No. It's a little different. You go back. You infect your world. You face annihilation, same as us. No. No. No, 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 no. No! I... I... <laughs> and Adam starts crying. Back braced against the wall, he lowers his head and he starts sobbing. Think... Sitlali leans in and tips his chin up. <laughs> What's your surname, Adam? <laughs> Smith. I'm... I'm... 36... 
I'm a Sagittarius. My birthday is December 3rd. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have a boyfriend. I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. My parents died when I was really young. I have a, I have a sister. One sister. She's three years younger than me. Uh, Sophie. Sophie. <sighs> Sophie Chen. She married uh, this tech dude. She's 33. She's uh, She's got these two kids. I'm unemployed. <laughs> what, um, what burial rites do they have in your world? What would you like done with your vessel? <laughs> I, I always thought, I always thought cremation was such a horrible way to go. Burned down to those little ashes, scattered. What kind of a death is that? I want to be buried. In the earth, in the ground, six feet deep. Casket. Funeral. But who'd fucking come, Sit Lolly? Who'd fucking come? Well, I know at least one person will be there. And they shove the monster energy drink into his hand. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, he opens up the monster energy drink. Like he tips the tab in. And there's like a little hiss of release. <laughs> and he, he sips at it. He takes a few drinks. <sighs> he let it go warm. You fuck. <laughs> you know how many realities I hopped through to get that? Alright. And he, like, drinks the rest of it. He just gozzles it down. Like, you see his eyes, like, flutter back in his head. He's, like, drinking it like it's... Like it's the last thing he's going to drink. Because it is. He just savors every drop and he even like tips it when it's empty like tips it like into his mouth <sighs> and he lowers the can down next to his feet do you have a god adam <laughs> you know funny enough i was an atheist before all of this and i'll say a prayer to the raven queen for you <sighs> do it Get your soul to your sister. And Salali leans in and kisses the part of his face that Adam bit of hers and slides the blade between his ribs. <sighs> Goodbye, Salali Thornheart. Goodbye, Adam Smith. <laughs> I'm sorry. And they pull the blade back out. And Adam Smith dies. And before his soul can go, who the fuck knows where, because he's not from here. So Lolly casts Spare the Dying and holds on to it. And from one of their pockets, pulls out their old holy symbol, the raven skull. And saying a prayer in raven speech to the raven queen as they do it, she tries to put Adam's soul inside of this skull, which they had all of the openings closed over in silver. So it would be the perfect vessel for a soul. As you siphon his soul out, every soul has a color. And, Sitlali, it is impossible to tell what color Adam's soul used to be. 
because right now it is so corrupted by empty magic like veins, black veins growing over a pomegranate that you don't know. And Adam's soul drifts into the skull and you hold it. We cut now back to the test room, back to Dewey. Dewey, you blink and you're back in the now. You are staring at the sharp fangs of the myriad digging into your arm, drooling black saliva all over you, those roving wild red eyes, looking, looking, looking in every direction but your own. He's clearly corrupted, clearly in pain, clearly driven by something inside him that is not himself. And now that you're back, you feel that pain dully throbbing, but you see the black veins of corruption reverse back down your feathers, back toward its teeth, as you're able to fight off mother's blood. What do you do or say, Dewey? Dewey, uh, resists the pain for a bit. And as soon as, like, just as it's about to retract completely from his, from his hand, from his body, uh, his normal instinct is to hide from pain shy away from it Uh, but he forces himself he's emboldened to grab onto it and pull on it it's the only way he knows how to connect with the myriad is through pain Um, and to pull the myriad closer to him and he leans right up into this enormous thing's face and asks weren't you someone before this (laughs) weren't weren't you someone before you were just a means to an end You know, I was. I had people I loved, and places I wanted to go, and things I wanted to do. And what I want more than any of this is to go back to that. I I don't think that I'm that same person anymore, but and I don't know if I can go back at all. But I have to try. Do the best I can for this reality. I was dragged into, and then go home. Where's home for you? What, what is home for you? Uh, and there's like a little jolt of pain uh, as his teeth clamp down harder on your arm, and you feel your bone begin to crunch. It, okay, so so maybe sadism isn't like the healthiest trait to base your entire personality on, uh, but we've we've all got flaws and things we could change to be better to the people around us. That doesn't mean you're not worth saving. And he crunches even harder, and yep, that's a fracture. That's definitely a fractured arm. Close to being broken. Please. I can't take- I can't take much more of this. And you can't either. I just- You have to grab onto what's left of you. And you see those, like, two human-like hands reach forward and grab- one grabs onto your shoulder, digging sharp claws into your flesh. The other one grabs onto your right arm that still has the burning rose in it, and... (sighs) And he crunches down and breaks your arm. And on, like, the snapping of that bone, that radiant explosion of pain rippling up your body. You see the myriad eyes blink once, twice, uh, and then you see that like black corruption sloughing like on the foam of their jaw, just sort of like course down in like a stream down, pooling by their feet as this corruption starts to bleed out of them. Like they're being tethered here by the pain they're inflicting onto you. And he releases your broken arm in like a single like motion, gleaming white teeth going wide, saliva flying, and he doesn't let go of your shoulder or your other arm, but he does lean backward and reel a bit. And as this happens, that massive skin wolf that was coming out of his back 
slowly like reverts back into his back and disappears underneath like the sleek surface of his suit jacket. <sighs> And when he blinks and looks at you with every blink, his eyes seem to be more focused, Dewey. Good morning, Cardu Quirk. Uh, we're back. Okay. That's something. And Dewey kind of like crumples into himself. And the myriad actually crumples with you? Like, he also falls down onto his knees, like, exhausted and just completely bent out of shape. And you and the myriad collapse to the ground. I think, like, his huge jawed head is in, like, the crook of your neck and your shoulder. Uh, and he's just sort of, like, panting and heaving against you, exhausted and tired. The two of you just sort of, like, slumped in this inert puddle of mother's blood. <sighs> you said you wanted to save me, Cardu. <laughs> and why is that? I was sent to kill you, and I would have. I have to believe there's something else influencing you. Look at this place. <laughs> the URL pumped me full of corruption. And it took something from you too, didn't it? This place, it fucked both of us over. That's why we have to stop it, take it down. <laughs> so you have grown a spine after all, cowardly Cardu. Suppose that moniker won't work for you anymore, will it? Look at you, fully realized paragon, new robes, new fire. It looks good on you. Uh, Dewey awkwardly takes the flaming rose behind his back and like shakes it so it goes out. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> thanks? You know. I never asked to be a demon. Be a hero. But we're not we're not doing the race here. <laughs> not yet anyway. And he sort of gets up onto a knee and then pulls himself all the way back up, like cracking his head one side, the other side, and he actually holds out a clawed hand to help you up as well. I take it a little hesitantly. And his claws dig a little bit into your arm, but they don't, like, break skin. Just enough to, like, put a little bit of pain on you. <laughs> Sorry, old habits die hard. Uh, and he pulls you back to, like, your full height. Now, now, Cardu. Are you ready for what comes next? Have to be. Are you? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm going to enjoy every second of killing Lilith. And on that, we are going to end the session. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for tuning in to ARC 7, Episode 3. I have been your Game Master, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me all across the internet at by Connie Chong, B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G. Uh, Ko-Fi, TikTok, Twitter, itch. Check me out. I'm going to pass along introductions up and over to Quinn. Hi, hello, I'm Quinn. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm a tabletop game, de 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 game designer, sensitivity reader, and actual play performer. Uh, you can find me and more about my work on Twitter at Quintastic underscore. That's three N's and an underscore. Uh, and I have a lot of feelings that I have to deal with now. Um, I'm a pass it to Erica. Hi everybody, I'm Erica, she your pronouns, I played Vasanti Nakshirzo, also she your pronouns, and uh, yeah, you can find me here on Twitch at Erica Please, uh, if you want to catch me on Twitter and see some of my thoughts there, that's Erica New Girl, why is it different, I don't want to go into it right now, Max, go ahead. Hey, I've been Max, my pronouns are they, them, I have played uh, Dewey, romance plots backloaded in this campaign, uh, Quirk, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at Starchmonger. Uh, I'm a dancer, uh, and I'm also a textile artist if you want to check me out at Stitchmonger on Instagram and Etsy.
uh, and I will pass it to Humna. Hello everyone, my name is Humna, I use any and all pronouns, and I am a TTRPG performer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at hshahid underscore, where I talk about all of the different projects that I'm a part of, and today I have been Jaron Gather, who gets a little corruption as a treat. Fantastic! Uh, thank you all so much uh, for tuning into this episode of Transplaner RPG, The Second Stranger. Uh, we're going to be raiding someone really awesome right now, no doubt. Toss them a follow if you like their stuff. Use the raid message in chat. And tune in next week for the next installment of the Chasm Group's shenanigans down into the chasm, into the thick of it. It is uh, it is fun. It is fun down there, right? Uh, for lack of a better term. It's terrifying. It's terrifying fun. Uh, so tune in Saturdays at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time for The Second Stranger. We love you so much. See you next Saturday and Spicho Picho!